All right, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1? Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. It's between Haggai and Habakkuk and the old, at, the end of the, end, at the end of your Old Testament. So Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to uh, look at verse 3 again this evening. We're going to continue uh, in that verse. Uh, we'll finish that off uh, tomorrow evening, this verse. There's a lot in this verse. That's why I took three evenings to do it. Tonight, we're going to be noting that the Lord will cause the destruction of of idolaters. So we'll be talking a lot about idolatry and in uh, and and this prophecy in Zephaniah 1.3. And uh, I, uh, I'm going to be sending uh, the completed translation of chapter 1 to you uh, tomorrow. So I, I finished it off today. All right, so uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. And uh, also, by the way, could you uh, keep in prayer Tom George? And um, he is, uh, is uh, very ill, so he is, uh, if you could keep him in prayer, that would be very... Uh, appreciative, um, and his wife, Kathy, and uh, their son, Hank. So um, let's take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to see if we're in, fe- in fellowship with God, that we need to, uh, if we need to confess our sins if uh, necessary. First John 1 John 1.9 restores us to fellowship with God, and we maintain that fellowship uh, through obedience to what the Spirit is te- uh, teaching us in the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. And so, uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says something uh, very similar. And actually, there's more involved in that passage than there is in 1 Peter 5, 7. So, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would uh, empower me to communicate your word with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect this, and power this evening. We pray that the Spirit would help each person to understand what's being taught and make application to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We pray, Father, that you would break down any barriers that sin and Satan would put up to hinder that from happening. Uh, Father, we also pray that you would help Tyler and Titus with the sound and recordings, the video, the audio. We pray we'd have no problems in that area. We thank you for their service and the technology. And we thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson and their hospitality and opening up their home to us uh, four days a week. We also lift up Tom George and his wife Kathy and, uh, and also uh, their son Hank. We just pray, Father, that you would give the doctors and nurses was in treating him, give him comfort at this particular time. And we pray, Father, that uh, he would uh, experience uh, your power in his weakness at this time. And we pray, Father, that you would uh, glorify yourself uh, in his life, Father. So, Father, we also, um, we also lift up um, other people in, uh, in our congregation that are, might be suffering with the different ailments and whatnot. We just lift them up and we pray that you would give them healing. If At this time, if not, you want them to persevere, help them to persevere. We pray that they would experience your power and their weakness as well. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, for this uh, service, that we continue to grow as a result of this service, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that your, you and your Son, Jesus Christ, are glorified in our lives. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. It should be at, uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, we're going to be noting... Uh, uh, the second prophetic statement that's found in verse 3, we're going to actually take three evenings to finish off this verse. We studied the first prophetic statement in the uh, in uh, last Thursday. Now we're going to, tonight, we'll continue on in the, st- in, the, in the verse, and then we'll tomorrow we'll finish it off because each, 
each of these prophecies are really, uh, we, we can get a lesson out of each one of them. We, there's a lot we can, we can learn. So that's what I've decided to do. So uh, this evening we're going to be noting the fact in verse 3 where the, uh, uh, the prophet Zephaniah says that the Lord will cause the destruction of idolaters. So what I want to do is read, let's read all the way from verses 1 through 6 and then uh, to see verse 3 in its context. So if you could look at Zephaniah 1.1, 1, 1, it says, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, the word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests and those who bow down on the, on the housetops to the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom and those who have turned back from following the Lord and those who have not sought the Lord or inquired of him. So verse, uh, in verse 3, uh, we, we covered last uh, Thursday the phrase, uh, the, the statement, the prophetic uh, declaration in verse 3, the very first one, I will remove man and beast. And then it says, and I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. Now this evening, we're going to be noting the, law, the prof prophetic declaration and the ruins along with the wicked. It's very, in, very um, I don't know, ambiguous in, the, in that statement here. By, uh, if you look at the New American Standard Translation, what does that mean? What does that mean? And the ruins, the Lord will remove the ruins along with the wicked. What does that mean? Because it, I don't think it makes a lot of sense in the New American Standard Translation. I think they could have done a, bit, a little bit better job in translating it. Uh, first of all, the word, for, and, uh, the word for the ruins in the New American Standard is the word makshelah. Now, this word makshelah means stumbling blocks. It actually means stumbling blocks because it pertains to that which causes destruction. And here it refers to the idols of those practicing idolatry in Judah. And this is indicated by the fact that in Zephaniah 1.4, that verse predicts the destruction of the idolatrous priests who worship their idols in the temple in Jerusalem. So uh, that's what we, uh, based upon what's being said in verse 4, uh, we can see that this word makshelah, it actually means stumbling blocks. It's in the plural. So it means stumbling blocks, and this is supported by what is being said in verse 4. Stumbling blocks in regards to their idol, these idols are stumbling blocks to worshiping the God of Israel. And this is the idea here with this word. So Zephaniah describes these idolatrous priests in verse 5 that we just read as worshiping the stars on the rooftops of their homes and also worshiping, worshiping the Ammonite deity Milcom. So these idols are described with this word makshelah as being a stumbling block since the practice of idolatry actually serves as an obstacle for the Jew and worshiping Yahweh, the Lord. So this is a, a, a very important that we see what this word means. Not the ruins, uh, in some contexts it could be that, but here we're talking about this word in relation to idols, the Id uh, idolatry. So the idea with this word is that these things, these, these, these different things, these, these idols that these the people of Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah were involved in a worshiping, were serving as stumbling blocks to worshiping the God of Israel. Now the word for wicked, it's the word uh, rasha, it's in the plural, and uh, we could translate it the wicked ones or the unrighteous ones. Uh, the New American Standard has a good translation. And the reason why is it pertains to being evil with emphasis on the guilt of violating a standard. So here it's used with regards to the idolatrous Jews living in Judah and the city of Jerusalem. And this word, Rasha, it actually describes these Jews as wicked or evil, but in what sense? In the sense that they are disobedient to God's law, which reflects his holy standards. They're disobedient. And by the way, this is unrepentant disobedience. They're the whole point of uh, God uh, judging them is because they're unrepentant about it. In fact, this prophecy is designed ultimately to bring about repentance. That's the, the intent 
that God has. But of course, we know from history that they refused to uh, repent, many of them, and they were uh, taken out and exiled to Babylon. Many, many of them were killed by the Babylonian hordes led by Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, a lot of times, you know, we saw this in Hebrews, that a believer, and we saw, what was it last, no, this past Sunday, I think it was, that a believer can have an evil and unbelieving heart. And how is that? Well, a believer, we're not talking about a believer who sp uh, sins sporadically, you know, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, had a mental attitude sin or they said something wrong or they did something wrong and they confessed it and, and everything moved on. We're talking about people and we're talking about believers here that this is their lifestyle. They, they don't confess their sins. And if, and, and, and if they do, they do it and then they go right, go right back to sinning and so they live in a habitual disobedience. That's a person who's involved in evil. Uh, a person who is keeping short accounts of God with God and confessing their sins when, whenever they sin, that's not a person involved in evil. This is a habitual activity. It's mental. It starts off in the, in the mentality of the soul and it manifests itself in words and actions. So specifically, this word rasha, the wicked, it describes these Jews as wicked or evil in the sense that they are disobedient to the first and second commandments of the Ten Commandments, which we studied in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. And we're going to be looking at them this evening because, uh, because we're talking in the context here in Zephaniah 1.3 with this prophetic statement in the context of idolatry. So when, when we talk about this word rasha, the wicked, it's a word that speaks of evil or wickedness, but from a perspective that these people are are habitually not uh, living according to God's standards. Where, for the Old Testament Jew, like Zephaniah in his day and King Josiah, and the, and the Jews of those days, the Old Testament dispensation of Israel, their standard of living by, to live by was the Mosaic Law. Now, we, we've been studying Colossians, and we're finding out that, you know, it, that we've seen this in the past, that Paul didn't want the Gentile Christians in Colossae, or the Jewish Christians for that matter, to live according to the Mosaic Law. It was not the way to live the Christian way of life. The gospel was for the church age believer like you and I and the Colossians and Paul's day and Paul himself, the apostles, was to live according to the gospel and appropriate by faith their union identification with Christ and his death and resurrection and consider themselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God or dead to the, 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 the Mosaic law and alive to God or the dead to the cosmic system of Satan and alive to God. So the, the, that, that's how we're supposed, what, what the standard we're to live. But in, the, in Old Testament Israel, in Zephaniah's day, when he penned this uh, prophecy, the Mosaic law was how uh, God governed the nation of Israel. And so uh, we see that Romans 9, 1 through 5, as we were seeing, seeing in our Colossians study, it was the, the Jew, not the Gentiles, that received the Mosaic law. And so in Old Testament Israel, the Mosaic law was the standard by which they lived. Now, they had what we call the ceremonial aspect of the law, they meaning they involved, they, uh, they observed certain foods that they could eat. They were clean and unclean when we were studying that. They lived by the dietary regulations of the law, and so did Daniel when we studied the book of Daniel. That was right for them to live by these things, but not us. The point of the ceremonial aspect of the law, there were several points, one of which was to distinguish the Israelites from their Gentile pagan neighbors. So like, for instance, the, uh, the food regulations. One of the reasons why they, God had those things was not simply just for health reasons, though there was health benefits to those things. It was a lot of the worship, of the, Can the Canaanite worship, it was centered around their diet. And the certain things that they ate it was in relation to their worship of their pagan gods. God wanted to distinguish Israel and keep them away from certain foods because uh, in, in certain eating habits or certain foods that, they, uh, that the Canaanites ate because those foods were associated with the worship of the Canaanite gods. So God didn't want Israel to fall into the, the worship of the Canaanite gods through the foods that they ate, all right, which were uh, associated with, the, like for instance, you don't, um, you know, we studied this in Exodus, I believe it was, you know, you don't um, what, cook a, 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 a you know, with a, in its mother's milk, you know, the, the calf in its mother's milk. That was related to the Canaanite worship of their God. That's why God said that, one of the, one of the reasons why. And so the, what we have is, for, for the Zephaniah in his day, guys like him and Daniel, 
They lived according to the Mosaic law. And so uh, for sancti sanctification purposes for them would be observing these dietary regulations, staying away from uh, you know, dead bodies and, and whatnot, things that were unclean to them. And so that would be their sanctification. But we in the church age are sanctified through the baptism of the Spirit, through our, our identification with Christ and his death and resurrection at the moment of our conversion, justification. So we have, the, the, you know, the, these things were just the shadow, as we saw in the Old Testament, of the things to come, which we're now benefiting from here in the New Testament dispensation, the church age. So Zephaniah, when he talks about this word, with his word, Rasha, the wicked, it speaks of people who are not living according to a particular standard. And in context, because we're talking about Israel, we're talking about the Mosaic law. And in particular, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments, they were breaking. So when God says, he says, I'm going to, if you look at my translation of Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 3, I'm about to cause the human race as well as the animal kingdom to be destroyed. I'm about to cause the birds belonging to the earth's atmosphere as well as aquatic life belonging to the various bodies of water to be destroyed. Then he says, likewise, the wicked who produced their idolatrous obstacles. So the idolatrous obstacles are speaking of the fact that these uh, people in the kingdom of Judah were breaking the first two commandments which dealt with uh, the Jews' relationship to God and idolatry. So through the, prophet, through the prophet Zephaniah, the God of Israel declares that he will also cause the destruction of the wicked who produced their idolatrous obstacles, their idols. So this refers, of course, to, to those practicing idolatry in Judah. And this is indicated by the fact that Zephaniah 1.4 predicts the destruction of the idolatrous priests who worship their idols in the temple of Jerusalem. Zephaniah describes these idolatrous priests in Zephaniah 1.5 as worshiping the stars on their rooftops of their homes and worshiping the Ammonite deity Milcom. These idols are described with, this, uh, with uh, the word, uh, uh, what's the word we hear in the Hebrew? Makshe La. These idols are described with this word as being a stumbling block since the practice of idolatry serves as an obstacle for the Jew and worshiping Yahweh. Now the wicked, the wicked here, in context, if you paid, if you pay strict attention to the context, I, that's why I read all the way up to verse 6, because in context, the wicked here are people who we would say are saved. These people already have a covenant relationship with the God of Israel. In fact, it's pretty explicit. They, they, they actually swear allegiance to him and yet swear allegiance to other gods. And it also says they turn back from following him, meaning implying that they at one time were following the God of Israel, meaning obeying him. But now they're going in a 180 direction and are not doing that. So if you look at the, uh, you can read it. Uh, you got my translation there in front of you? Um, look, at, uh, look at verse, let's start at... Uh, Let's start at verse 1 of my translation. Zephaniah 1.1. The message originating from the Lord was communicated to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, grandson of... Ge oh, I'm sorry. You were passing on. Okay, sorry. Oh, don't worry about it. Cool. Thanks, Titus. Thank you. So Zephaniah 1.1 1, 1 from my translation, the we'll read all the way through up to verse 6, and, and we'll read it very carefully. The message originating from the Lord was communicated to Zephaniah, son of Cushai, grandson of Gedaliah, great-grandson of Amariah, great-great-grandson of Hezekiah, during the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Then the Lord, Zephaniah is quoting the Lord directly, I will ex surely exterminate... Yes, I'm about to cause every living thing to be destroyed on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I'm about to cause the human race, as well as the animal kingdom, to be destroyed. I'm about to cause the birds belonging to the earth's atmosphere, as well as aquatic life, belonging to the various bodies of water to be destroyed. Likewise, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles. Keep reading. Yes, I will bring about the violent execution of the human race residing on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I will stretch out my hand against Judah as well as each and every one of Jerusalem's inhabitants. 
Why? Specifically, I will bring about the violent removal from this place, the number belonging to Baal, the well-known pagan priest. Well, right now we've, we've seen really no indication of he's talking about believers or not. Although, uh, verse 3 uses the, word, the covenant name of God in verse 3. But that could be also the fact that the God of Israel is actually the God is, is sovereign over the Gentile nations and not just Judah. So you can't uh, keep reading. We've got to have more information here about the wicked. Verse 5, also, those who rep repeatedly prostrate themselves on their rooftops, meaning face down, before the multitude of celestial bodies belonging to the stellar universe. Likewise, those who bind themselves by a promise to remain loyal to the Lord, while at the same time they bind themselves by a promise to remain loyal to the king. And that's, the word king there is used in a sarcastic way to talk about Baal. Then it says in verse 6, pagan, pagan God, Canaanite God. Verse 6, yes, here's the indication with the wicked involved believers in Judah. Yes, those who turn themselves back from following after the Lord. Specifically, those who never make it their habit of seeking after the Lord's will. Consequently, they never make it a habit of making a request of him. Meaning they don't pray to him. They don't obey his word. And look at it, they turn themselves back. This is a volitional decision, when we get to it and we study it, this is a volitional decision that they have, they're turning away from following the Lord. They used to be, it implies, but they're not anymore. So we got, not only, we have, not only, you could say, unregenerate unbelievers involved here, that the Lord's going to judge for their idolatry, for the practice of idolatry, but we also, the context tells us, that we have believers here, people who were declared justified through faith in the Lord in Zephaniah's day. That means they have a covenant relationship with God. And Israel, if you trusted in the Lord as your, God, as your Savior and God, and recognized Him as your sovereign, and swore allegiance to Him, you had faith in Him. You were part of His covenant people, Israel. All right? We, we don't, we're, the, we're not, uh, today when you believe in Jesus Christ, you're part of the church. You become a part of the member of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ. Uh, at the moment of your conversion through faith alone and Christ alone. In Israel, you became a part of the covenant people Israel, which is different entity than the church. So either way, to get into the, the church or to get into Israel, you had to have faith in the Lord. And of course, the God of Israel, Jesus taught us, and the apostles is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see here the wicked... And verse, if you look at verse 3 again, when he says, likewise, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles, uh, the Lord's going to destroy them. He's, he's, the wicked there refers to not only, you could say, non-believers in Judah and around the world, but also regenerate Jews in apostasy who are practicing idolatry in Judah as well as unregenerate Jews who are doing so as well. It refers to idolatrous, regenerate, and unregenerate Jews living in Judah and the city of Jerusalem, this word, the wicked. It describes these Jews as wicked or evil in the sense that they're disobedient to God's law, the Mosaic law, which reflects his holy standards. And as we said before, specifically, it describes these Jews, both saved and unsaved, we could say, regenerate, unregenerate, as wicked or evil in the sense that they're disobedient to the first and second commandments of the Ten Commandments. Now, don't miss this. Remember, we said the Ten Commandments are applicable to, 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 to the unsaved. Remember, Paul says that in 1 Timothy. But the Ten Commandments in, in Israel were not just for the, the people who are part of the covenant people of God. They were actually for the whole world, the Gentiles, because, remember, the Gentile, the, 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 the non-Jew, who was an unbeliever, Paul says in Romans 2, 14 and 15, they have the Ten Commandments, uh, they have an awareness of the Ten Commandments in their hearts. In fact, those Ten Commandments show up in Genesis before the giving of the law at Mount Sinai to Moses in Israel. So there was an awareness that the first, that you, know, I, you should have no gods before me. They knew that about God. In fact, we're going to see in Romans this evening, yeah, I think it'll be tonight, we're going to see in Romans 1, 8 through 31, 32, that they're aware of this, that they, their, their practice in idolatry is wrong. They're aware of this, okay? Because they have this inherent law in them, the Ten Commandments. Paul talks about in Romans 2, 14 and 15. So the unsaved have no excuse either because they know idolatry is wrong because it's written into their souls that, they, that, that it's wrong. So 
The wicked here, that's very interesting. We, we, depending on your relationship with God, you know, God says, I'm going to destroy. If you look at verse uh, 3 again in my translation, he says, I want to bring out something about when God, when God exercises his righteous indignation against us believers, when we're in apostasy, it's a little bit different, a lot different actually, than his exercise of his righteous indignation to a, a, uh, an unbeliever. And I'll, I'll explain why. You probably have a good idea already, but it bears uh, explaining. Zephaniah 1.3 from my translation. I'm about to cause the human race as well as the animal kingdom to be destroyed. I'm, I'm about to cause the birds belonging to the earth's atmosphere, as well as aquatic life, belonging to the various bodies of water to be destroyed. Likewise, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles. Yes, I will bring about the violent execution of the human race residing on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So the wicked are, based upon the context, verses 3 through 6, speak of both unbelievers and Judah, and around the world, and also believers in, in Israel. Now, this we see is another, demo, uh, God speaking about his righteous indignation. It's an, God's wrath, it's, uh, the word in the New Testament is orge. Wrath it speaks of God's legitimate anger towards sin. A better translation for wrath, I think, because it gets across the idea, it, 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 it explains God, what it is a lot clearer, I think, than the word wrath. Righteous indignation. Because it, that phrase, it actually expresses, I think, the, what God, God's wrath is, what this, these words mean. What, the, what they, their idea, when God speaks of his wrath in the scripture, it speaks of his righteous indignation. Meaning, righteous in, means it's legitimate that he has an indig indignation towards people. God has a legitimate anger towards sin. Because why? Because it's contrary to his holy character and his law. And see, we, we, because we don't have the same steed as God has because we, God is uncompromising on his standards. Uh, that's why he, he couldn't do anything. The human race couldn't do anything to help itself. He had to send his perfect, send his, his perfect son to become a human being and die on the cross to deal with this this, this wrath that was on the whole human race because they're sinners by nature and by practice, which we studied in, in our subject of salvation. So God's uncompromising. So something had to be done if sinners were going to have a relationship with him or have any kind of relationship with God because God's holiness demanded that they be judged and, for their sin. So he sent his son to the cross and he showed his hatred for sin and his love for sinners all at the cross through his son, Jesus Christ. So his son faced the wrath, the father's wrath, and instead of us in our place. Now, anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior avoids the wrath of God in the lake of fire. All right? So the one who doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're going to face the wrath of God. So they had a way out through Jesus, but they chose not to go. So now they'll have to face God's wrath for all eternity in the lake of fire. So God's wrath, it's his legitimate anger towards sin, meaning he has every right to be angry at sinners. All right? That he has every right because why? He is holy. He's perfection. We're not. The angels are not. He finds fault with his, his, his angels, it says in the Old Testament. And in fact, Romans 5, no one was in, in heaven and earth worthy to open the seven seal scroll. The title deed to earth, only the lamb was. That implies both men and angels are unworthy before God who is holy. So, the, the, when the wrath of God, when God's exercising his righteous indignation, when he exercises it toward a believer... Or an unbeliever, it's always for good intention. We're talking about before they die, all right? There's, oh, he has good intentions. What is his intention toward the unbeliever? To get them to repent. Sometimes God uses blessing and people, and people get saved. Many times it's through a crisis. And God's exercising his wrath toward that person with the intent that they would turn to him and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. For the believer who's an apostasy, 
God's trying to break their sinful patterns of behavior because it's unhealthy for them and it's unbecoming of a child of God to live like in sin, like they did prior to becoming Christians. So he disciplines us because he loves us, Hebrews 12, and his intention is to form godly character in us. We might not enjoy the discipline, but it's for our own benefit. It humbles us and it shows us our need and it draws us closer to him. And for a believer in apostasy, it, its design is to wake them up to confess their sin and start turning their lives around and being habitually obedient to God's word and not just giving God a nod, you know, and giving him lip service like, Old Test like Israel did in Jesus' day. They really, their hearts were far from him. So very important. So when, when, when God's, uh, when God's uh, demonstrating his wrath towards his, the believers whether it's co the covenant people of Israel or the church, when he's exercising his wrath toward us, believers, he's doing it, and, but it's tempered. His, indig his righteous indignation, his wrath is tempered because it can't go all, it's, it's only to a certain point that he could, he could inflict punishment because we're his children. We're his children, ultimately. Um, ultimately, we will never face the wrath of God in the lake of fire. So that we know that it's his, his wrath toward us is tempered. He's angry with us because when, we, when we're in apostasy, but he still loves us. We're already a part of his family. He can never disown us. All right? So when it comes to the unbeliever, obviously God has good intentions when he inflicts suffering on the unbeliever. But ultimately, he knows if they're, they're not going to make it, but he will do everything he can and exhaust every avenue so, to, so that... You know, there'll be no excuses when they stand before his son, Jesus Christ, at the great white throne judgment. They'll never be able to say that God didn't try to reach them and didn't do everything he could in his, in his power to, to try to, show, to wake them up. But they choose of their own volition to say no. So the, the wicked here are both Jews in, that are uh, regenerate, saved, in apostasy. And we know that from they, early, later in the context where it says they turned away from the Lord, implying that they were obeying him. And they're unbelievers, obviously. And also you could say the, 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 the Gentile pagan neighbors of Israel, unregenerate gen, Gentile pagan neighbors in Israel, they too are under God's wrath. They're going to face God's righteous indignation here as being described here in this prophecy in verse 3. So we see here that these Jews, uh, the wicked here, both Jews and Gentiles, uh, who were unrepentant sinners, we could say, were guilty of idolatry. And so what this is telling us is that God is angry, has legitimate anger toward anyone, whether you're a believer or unbeliever, who's an unrepentant idolater. Unrepentant meaning you haven't confessed your sin, or if you're a believer or unbeliever, you haven't uh, repented and changed your mind about Jesus and trusted him as Savior. Or if you're a believer and you're in apostasy and habitually disobedient, you haven't confessed your sin. And if you have, you haven't turned around and remained obedient to him. You confessed it and went right back into sinning. So God, just like he was back in Zep, what I'm trying to tell you is just as he was angry, legitimately angered toward Unrepentant sinners in Zephaniah's day, it's true today. It's true today. Remember we saw, in, you know, uh, some people, uh, remember 1 Corinthians? Paul's talking to the Corinthian church. Some people were getting um, drunk at the Lord's table. They're being gluttons. They weren't waiting for each other. And he said, some of you are sick. Some of you are weak. Some of you are, fell asleep, died. Those are the three stages of divine discipline. Why? God was angry with them. So, again, as I've been trying to tell you, let's, we need to be, have a healthy respect for God uh, as believers because in the, how do you demonstrate that healthy respect? Can, keep short accounts with God. When you sin, don't wait till you get to church to go confess it. Confess it immediately. Whether, whether it's a mental sin, because that's the worst, because that's, that, that's where the verbal ones come and the, the, uh, the, the sinful actions come. They flow from your thinking. So you've got to keep very close attention to what you're thinking. Very, very important. And if you don't, that's going to affect your words and your actions. So you keep short accounts with God, confess the sin when you need to, and then 
when you confess the sin, all that's done is restored you to fellowship. You stay in fellowship by bringing into obedience uh, God's word, obeying it, bringing your thoughts into obedience to what the word of God says. So again, example would be you're bitter at somebody. Well, that's sin. Confess the sin and then do what the Bible says. Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Colossians 3, if anyone has a complaint against anybody, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what the Spirit's saying to us. So we, if we, we need to do that because that demonstrates a healthy respect for God. The people who have respect for the Lord in the church are the ones who are learning, making an effort to learn his word and are doing it. Not one and without the other. No, they're learning and they're doing. Okay? And this is what, that's a person in the church, a believer, a church age believer who shows respect for the Lord. So we need to have a healthy respect for the Lord. Otherwise, we're going to get disciplined. So for the, for the believer, when God, when God exercises his righteous indignation toward a believer, it's called di discipline. A discipline as a, of a child. God's child. God's disciplining his children. It's different than God disciplining somebody who has no relationship to him at all. It's a big difference. You parents, you're not, you, when, you, when you discipline your kids, it's a, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's a lot different being angry with your kids than it is being angry with somebody else's kids. Or see somebody else, they're your kids. They're, they're, you have a relationship to them. You've brought, brought them into the world. You've raised them up. You have a connection with them. You have a relationship with them. It's, it's a totally different, you're, you're, when you punish your kids, it's a totally different ball game than it would be dealing with somebody else's kids. You don't have any connection with anybody else's kids. Okay, they're not yours. So idolatry here is very, very, God's saying, I'm, I'm going to inflict my righteous indignation, my wrath on idolaters. And I don't care if they're a believer or an unbeliever, I'm going to deal with those people. Why? Because I am holy. You will respect me. You will, what is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So let's go to Exodus chapter 20. And let's look at a passage we studied in detail in the past when we did the book of Exodus. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, with the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Now that commandment addresses the Israelites' relationship with the Lord. Now remember, these people are all saved, we would say. Paul, we, the, the, he's talking to believers here. However, though that's the case again, unbelievers know of this. Because what Paul says in Romans 2, 14 and 15. And also, you look at the book of Genesis. You could tell there was an awareness of, these, of, this, of this commandment here. And the next one to follow. And Romans 1, 18 through 32. It implies that they know about this. So it, yes, it was given to Israel here. But unbelievers, Gentile unbelievers, they know of this too. It's in their heart. It's written into their heart by God. So this commandment in Exodus 20 verse 3 was addressing the Israelites' relationship with the Lord. In the Hebrew text, this first commandment actually should be rendered, you must never have other gods over or against me. The word never I like better as for the negative particle there low because it's emphatic here. It's, it's obviously emphatic. So instead of you shall have no other gods before me, the word never in English brings out the emphatic idea. You must never have other gods over or against me. This commandment appears in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 7 as well, people. The term God there uh, is uh, the term Elohim, excuse me, gods. It's in the plural. Sometimes it's used for the God of Israel in relation to uh, his uh, transcendent character and sovereignty. The term Elohim is speaking of uh, the word gods there. It's the term Elohim. It refers to either angels or men, since it can refer to either human rulers 
or angelic beings. And this commandment is an implicit acknowledgement that there are men who are worshipped as gods as well as angels. Therefore, this first commandment prohibits the Israelites from practicing idolatry and worshipping angels or men or the creation, we could say as well, obviously, rather than God who is their creator and redeemer. This, word, this uh, particular uh, commandment here denotes the uniqueness of God and that he's the only being in creation who is to be worshipped by the Israelites. He's the only one worthy of our worship. It expresses God's claim upon the Israelites and demands their absolute loyalty and allegiance to him. So we see that this... Uh, uh, this commandment is, is prohibiting the Israelites from practicing idolatry, whether it's worshiping an angel or men or anything in the creation, an animal, something like that. Or the stars of the heaven, we'll, as we'll see as we go further in Zephaniah. Some people will work into astrology. So this is the idea with this particular commandment. The, this is the fact that the, the, the people of the world and in Judah and Zephaniah's day they were habitually, they were unrepentant sinners with regards to this commandment, this first commandment. And that's why God says, I'm going to inflict punishment on you, all of you for doing this. Now, look at verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. So, this commandment also addresses the Israelites' relationship with Yahweh. It's a prohibition against the practice of idolatry. In the Hebrew, it actually means you must never make for yourself an idol or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water beneath the earth. This prohibition denotes that nothing in creation must ever be copied and used as an object of worship by the Israelites. It prohibited the Israelites from making images or likenesses of Yahweh. Didn't that, isn't that what happened with, uh, when Moses was up in Mount Sinai? And what did Aaron do? Well, this is your God. That he violated this commandment when he did that. They were creating an image that was supposed to depict the God of Israel. And God says, I don't want anything, any animal or anything depicting me. And that's what they did. As we studied. Now in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 23. Paul describes the entire human race as involved in idolatry. So hold your, uh, you don't have to hold your place. Go to Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God, his righteous indignation, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God, look what he says, that which is known about God is evident within these people. The atheist is just as well. He's just in denial. But that's what he, we know. How do you know that, Bill? Because that's what Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the spirit through Paul. He's speaking truth. And he says, that which is known about God is evident within these people. For God made it evident to them. For since the create, and he made it inside of them with the inherent law, Paul mentions in Romans 2, 14 and 15, and outside of them through creation. Look what Paul says. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they're without excuse. So what's the deal with the atheist? You know, they're in denial. What else could you say? I mean, they could sit there and talk and have a big intellect and all that stuff. At the end of the day, they're in denial. They're rejecting God. They know about him. And they're stubborn. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile and their speculations and their foolish heart was dark. And that's why I hear these intellectual atheists out there. And I just sit there going, futile, all I can think of is this, futile in their speculations and their foolish heart is darkened. That's them. It's sad, but that's what God, Paul's saying here. The Spirit is saying to Paul, professing to be wise, they become they became fools. And we're seeing this like never before in Western civilization in America. We're seeing 
the ad, uh, atheism just is blossoming throughout this world in this country because we've rejected the scriptures and we've rejected God and creation. We rejected his, his existence. I mean, it's just insanity what's going on, right? Well, that's the influence of Satan on everybody. Look at verse in the sin nature. Verse 23, and they exchange, here's the idolatry, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is why God was mad at the people, angered legitimately at the people in Zephaniah's day, not only believers in Judah, but the unbelievers. In fact, through all of their pagan neighbors, the Gentile pagan neighbors in different, different countries surrounding Israel. This is why God was angry with them, because of this. Just think about it. You, you say, oh, God, you're being mean. These poor people. No, you're God. Think about from God's perspective for a second. Don't be saying, oh, these poor people. God created them. <laughs> he put within them an, an ability to know him and to get to know him. He was not far from them. He gave himself a witness within them with the conscience and outside of them with creation. Okay? He gave them the Bible. He gave them Jesus Christ. And these people, he gave them their existence. They couldn't think or make a decision without God giving them that ability. They wouldn't have the bodies that they have if it wasn't God giving them a body. They wouldn't be able to breathe if God didn't give them air and food and drink. None of that would have happened without God. Okay? So here's God. He's done all that. And he should be what? He shouldn't be upset with the way these people are treating him. The amazing thing is that God doesn't come down on him immediately. No, he's, God is gracious. And he's patient. He's long-suffering. But he's not eternal suffering. He's long-suffering. He'll put up with it to a certain extent, but then there's the line. He draws the line, reject my son. And if you're a believer and you don't, wanna, you don't listen to the discipline, eventually it's dying discipline and he's taking you out. Okay? So God, look at it from his perspective. How would you feel if you were God? You would be angry too and have every right to be angry. You created these people. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're a parent. Parents can understand in kids. You're a parent. You bring this kid into the world. You, you know, you, you, you and your wife, you get, to get, you get these kids or something. You, you, you inherit these kids from another marriage, whatever. So you have these kids and you raise these kids up and you give them, you nurture them. You change their dirty diapers. You're there when they're sick and throwing up. And you're there when they're, you know, through their bad times as kids and everything. And they're, and they're and, you know, they're sick and they're going to the doctors. And you're, you're there for everything. And you feed them and you go to work and you make sacrifices and you do all these things with these kids. And then the kid says, I hate you. They're a jerk. And they run away from home. They, don't never, they never honor you again. They never, they never thank you for anything. They just, just real, how would you feel as a parent? It would, it would be, even unbelievers know, that would be horrible for a kid to treat his parents like that when the parents have made sacrifices for these kids. Wouldn't you, wouldn't, wouldn't you be, even unbelievers would be saying, that's terrible. The kid's like that. Well, think about God now. He's created everybody. And yet they say, we don't think you exist. You don't, you don't exist. <laughs> We're not going to give you the time of death. We don't... We don't believe that you could be, there's a God, such a God. How could there be a God? You know, they, and you don't think he has every right to be angry with these people when there's no excuse for them to be doing this? They're doing it because they're like their father, the, their father, the devil, who is like, I don't want to, shaking his fist at God, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over and the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. That's judgment. He gave them over. When he uses that phrase, gave them over, it means that's judgment. And what's this judgment in relation to? Lesbianism and homosexuality. That's what it says. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Idolatry. Who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function of that which is unnatural. Women having sex with women is unnatural. 
And in the same way, also the men abandon their natural function of the woman and burn in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. That's God exercising his wrath toward them. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, see, this is the choice they made. God, God gave them over, there we go again, judgment, over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, they're not ignorant about it, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. See what I told you? They know of the Ten Commandments. Idolatry is one of those commandments that Paul's talking about that they're breaking. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So de idolatry, it's very serious. Deuteronomy 32, 17 and 1 Corinthians 10, 20. Those two verses, if you compare them, they teach that the worship of idols is connected to the worship of demons because the sacrificing of, to idols is in reality sacrificing to demons because demons promote the worship of idols. Satan is promoting anything that will, people will worship that is not Jesus Christ. They promote it. Who do you think it comes from? Satan is the first idolater, and he put himself up as God. So idolatry, what is it? It's the worship of something created as opposed to the worship of the creator himself. Scores of references to idolatry appear in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 20 verse 24, chapter 24 verse 2 says that Abraham, his father, sacrificed to idols. He served idols. His father was involved in that. The most noteworthy instance of idolatry in the history of Israel was Aaron's making of the golden calf at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai. We studied that in Exodus 32. Idolatry originally meant the worship of idols or the worship of false gods by means of idols, but came to mean, among the Old Testament Hebrews, any worship of false gods, whether by images or otherwise, or the worship of the Lord through visible symbols. So that's why God is angry with the, the inhabitants of the earth, including king of Judah, in Zephaniah's day, because they were practicing idolatry. And they were under the influence of demons and were deceived and didn't even know it. Idolatry is not only giving to uh, the giving to any creature or human creation the honor or devotion which belongs to God alone, but also is putting anything ahead of your relationship with God and which would prevent you from doing as well. So that means we too, here in the church age, in our day and age, we might not worship a, 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 a symbol of an animal. You know, we might not be doing that. We, not, we might not be worshiping a figurine. But we're worshiping other things, just like they did in Old Testament times. What's that? Money. Wait till we go later into chapter 1. There are people in Israel who took their trust and security on wealth and possessions, just like they do in America today, and just like they do in the church today. That's why the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth prosperity gospel, where the, the out there today in America, and it's been around for a while, that's all, that, 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 that appeals, and, and, the, and, the, uh, and the Joel Olstein, the people who are playing to people's narcissism and, and materialism and love for money. That's why the prosperity gospel is appealing to many Christians in America today, because they love money. They, that's their idol, materialism, possessions. And sp today we have sports and entertainment in our country. We make, we make heroes out of music, rock musicians who have no self-control and do drugs, you know, and are terrible people and don't care about anybody but themselves. We, we make idols out of them, whereas we have guys who are sacrificing their lives for, for their country and making great sacrifices in their family, and they don't even get the time of day, and they make pins for salary. Or the people who put their lives on the line who are firefighters or people who put their lives on the line that are police officers going into terrible cities like Chicago and risking their lives for people who don't even care, and yet they give their lives, and nobody makes them heroes. They're not considered a hero. No, we'll make the Kim Kardashians 
and uh, and these crazy and entertainers today, and the uh, and the Beatles and and Elvis, and making them out to be uh, you know big stars or heroes, and worshiping them. In sports and athletes, athletes, it's just sports. You know, people in New England, they're all freaking out. Oh, the Patriots lost. Oh my gosh, we no one in the rest of the country can't stand people in New England. Dad says he's laughing. It's true. They compl- the Patriots. For the last 15 years in the Belichick-Brady era, they've won four Super Bowls. They've gone to six of them. They should have won six. Freaky, close plays beat them. And then, then they go and they, get, they, get, uh, they won what? They went to 10 AFC championship games. Nobody in the NFL has done anything like that ever. And yet, the Patriots fans, they're all depressed because they lost the last game. Oh, our tablets were out. During the during partway during the game, we got we there was a conspiracy against us. The NFL tried to take us out. Hey, give me a break! It's it's just football. It's sports. They'll probably win it again next year for crying out loud. Give me a break! Because people in New England, many of them, and I know because I'm one of those people. I used to I used to be right there as a wicked idolater. Far as sports was concerned, you kidding me? I know about this firsthand. Sports. Hey, out here, NASCAR. I don't see the big deal riding around a car, around a track. I don't see what the big deal is about that. I can see it's fun driving around a car, but I would get bored riding around in circles the whole night. That would, you know, I mean, the best thing about NASCAR is if you win the race, you get kissed by a pretty girl and you drink some milk. Big deal, right? But that's, people love, they're, they're into a NASCAR. It's their God. They live, they live, eat, drink at NASCAR or college football. Oh, that's the other big... Oh my gosh, college football. Oh, you, the, you know, and they idolize these athletes and they just make a big deal. They're just athletes. They're not making, I'm sorry to, to break it to you, but being a great football player and throwing for 10 million yards and winning four Super Bowls, it doesn't make you, what does that make you? You played football, you, you played with a little ball. Okay, you played a ball and you smack heads with other guys, grown men, big deal. What did it advance? What did it, what did it do for society? Really, at the end of the day, it entertained people. It took people's minds off of the reality of life, is the emptiness of life. That's what it did. It didn't do anything else. Let's put it in perspective. But we don't have it in perspective in our country. We make these people out to be bigger than they are. How else can you account for people who are, you know, great men who and w- women who sacrificed their lives and lost limbs? and are in hospitals now, and are, have, have all this trouble. Yet we don't, we, don't, we don't think anything of those people. Oh, let's just get really close to home in the church. How about those, all those men and women, the great men and women in this, that are living today in this country, that are living and giving their lives to the gospel and around the world, who are faithful and teaching the word of God and living it out in their life, and they're persevering through all kinds of trials and tribulations. You don't, the church doesn't think much of those people, of their own, who are giving them a great example of Christ's likeness and being invisible heroes against Satan and his kingdom. Wait, do, we honor, do we honor those people? I'm not saying we should make idols of those people. Obviously, Jesus Christ is the one we're lifting up. But really, what we value in our country is a sign of the great idolatry that's in our country. What we value says everything about us. So, ultimately, in the New Testament, idolatry came to mean not only the giving to any creature or human creation, the honor or devotion which belonged to God alone, but the, but the giving to any human desire precedence over God's will. So, you know, you, you, you heard the great, you heard me teach this. We've got to wrap this up soon. Abraham, I keep coming back to that. Isaac, he waited until he was an old man, 100 years old, before he got that kid. The kid grows up, he's like in his 30s, early 30s, and God says, I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham was going to walk up that mountain, did it, knowing that God could raise him from the dead. He was, about, he was going to do it. He, he was not going to let his love for his son take precedence over his obedience to God. And that's the thing every single one of us have got to come to grips with. It, there'll be times in your life where God will lead you to a crossroads. Are you going to obey me, Bill? You can put your name in there. Or are you going to go and put this, your love for your wife, for your kids, or your husband, or your parents, out of your relationship with God? 
Jesus said, you shall, you shall have no gods before me. Jesus said, don't put your father and mother ahead of me. You're your brothers and sisters. I'm, does that mean to forsake your relationship or your responsibilities to your family? No. He's saying, don't put love for parents or family or whatever over your love for God. And you get a lot of Christians say, oh, I know that. Yeah, they don't know. They, they don't live their lives like that because they use their kids going to the ball games as an excuse how sick and wimpy that is. I can't go because my kid has a ball game. Can I tell you something about the ball game thing? Let me tell you something. The ball game and the sports thing is out of control in our country. Out of control in our country. Where Christian parents now, it's more important to get your kid to the football game than the Bible class? What happened there? They bought the lie. They bought the lie. You're better off, look at if I'd rather have my kid in Bible class than at football practice. And I love sports. If football practice can be fit in around Bible class, great. But if it can't, Bible class gets precedence. Serving in your church gets precedence. That's more important. I know this because I see, I grew up in a family. We were bulk, my, my, my mother, we were, I was riding back in the day. We never got rode. My parents never rode me anywhere. I had to walk 50 miles to go to my ball games and my bare feet and everything in a driving rain. Back in the day, luxury. <laughs> I get one up you there. And you know what? <laughs> you, you, this, this, and my, my, I, I, my brother's kids. The kids, are, they get a game every day of the week. They got soccer. They got the seasons change, football, baseball, basketball. They're on the, well, you know, they go to, a, they go to a, actually a Catholic school. They get actually a Christian school, and they do get some theology at, 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 at school during the week. So I'll give them that. Thank God. But really, there are some parents, Christian parents, that come into Bible class. Oh, it's, it's, not, it's not important. Sports is more important. I mean, one guy, one father, he was like, he said, oh, you know, just, you know, you know, I didn't want to go to the, I, I wanted to go to this kid's, you know, this thing for the kid. And, you know, if I went to Bible class and have him go to Bible class, then he'd give a bad attitude Bible class. And I said, wait a minute, are you training this kid? Are you training this kid in what is important or what? Because what you just said to me is that the stupid game is more important or the, whatever it was then come into Bible class. Now, let's balance it here, because so you don't misunderstand me. If the kid's got something, he's got driver's ed, he's got something during the week, and he's at Bible class all the time, that's no problem, all right? So just don't, nobody just think that I'm thinking, you can't do anything, you just gotta go Bible class every night and all that stuff, and be like Pastor Bill and all that stuff, I don't know. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, sports, a bit, you know, constantly is keeping your kids away. You're keeping your kids away from Bible class and serving in their church and learning what it is to be a Christian who is faithful to the, play, the church they're called. And you keep them away because you don't want to upset them and keep them out of certain events and activities. Something wrong with you as a parent. What are your priorities? What you're telling your kid is church isn't important. It isn't. But yet the early church, how many times have I taught that? Early church taught they, were meet, they met every day, seven days a week. Now, there's no command to meet every day, seven days a week. But, geez, you, you don't have time to go on a, on a Tuesday night to Bible class? or what, what are you doing on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, watching Dancing in the Stars or some stupid thing? What's your priorities? Television is a god, an idol. Oh, that's a big one. I could keep running on and on and on. Television is a big idol. You're better off without a television, quite frankly. I really believe that. If your kids don't watch television, no big deal. They're better for it. And then if they want to get in their own house and they want to watch that stupid boob tube, do they call it a boob tube for nothing? Go ahead, because there's nothing on television. I get this uh, uh, Amazon Prime, and Titus is laughing. He's like, I get all these, these movies, and I can't even make up my mind what movie I want to watch half the time. I have to flip a coin, and then when I watch the movie, it's like, this was a stupid waste of time. You know, once in a while, you get a good one. But it's like, you know, I'd rather read a good book. I'd rather read my bio. I'd rather study. You know, to me, that's entertaining, just more entertaining than watching a, a movie. A lot of times the movie's just stupid. So idolatry could be anything, even a human relationship that's legitimate, keeping you away from your relationship with God. Here's a good one. I married a lot of people through the past several years, over the years. 
And one thing I noticed is usually when you marry, a lot of times you marry these people, and then, you know, they come to Bible class, and, and basically they just wanted you to marry them. And then as soon as you marry them, they don't come to Bible class anymore. So I, well, I have a rule about now, if I marry somebody, You've already got to be doing it, and I have, I'm not going to give you any kind of time. In fact, I don't even know if to marry anybody, really. I think you, you're better off single. I'll marry you if I like you. You get people, I can't believe, they, they, all of a sudden they get married. When they were single, they come to Bible class all the time. You see them all the time. They're involved in the ministry. Soon as, once they got married, goodbye. What did they tell you about them? Getting a relationship was really their motivation, it seems, to come into Bible class. So I can get a nice little Christian man, a Christian woman. Yeah, they're great. They're apostate because they don't want to come to Bible class anymore. I got what I wanted. I'm out of here. I see that all the time. Very really, I could count on one hand the people I married who actually fact, up their attendance. I can think of one couple. They up their attendance. They're all, all here all the time when I, after I married them. Not that they weren't going already before, but that's, that's unusual. That's unusual. And, the, you know, there are people, you know, there's still couples that I married that, that are still with me, but there's a, a ton of them, I don't see them anymore. And they get the excuse, ah, I'm 45 minutes away to drive. I says, oh, I was driving an hour to Bible class. I have to say that. I was driving an hour to Bible class. I know a lot of people who did that, and people who drove an hour and a half and two hours to Bible class. I used to do it six days, six times a week. And they can't take one, even one day during the week to get in their little cars and drive down the road 45 minutes. You know why they can't? Because it's not important to them. They don't respect God, and they don't associate church with serving God. They don't. They disassociate the two. They compartmentalize church. Idolaters. God's going to deal with you. And then they wake up, and it's amazing. Then they get hit, God deals with them, and something happens in their life, and all of a sudden they're looking at me, hey, I was warning you the whole time. God was warning me. Through, I was, I, you think I was just blowing a hot air? I had nothing better to do? No, God was warning you through me, and you didn't pay attention, and now you're dealing with it, and now you want, you're coming to me and asking me, what do you want me to do? Why don't you do what the Bible says to do? Confess the sin and stop screwing around and messing around with God and... and do something about it. Obey him and make it a habit. Come to church. Listen to the word of God. Otherwise, you're messing with fire. Literal hot fire. God's wrath is fiery. You don't want to mess with him. Look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. We're coming near the end here. You know, I was thinking about ending around, right around 8 o'clock, and God had other, other, uh, other ideas. Exodus 20, verse 5. You shall not worship them, these idols, or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting, not the jealousy that's sin. This is a jealousy which God is legitimately demands that we have an exclusive relationship with him and not with other idols, other gods. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord... Your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. These verses serve to explain the second commandment. The Israelites were prohibited from worshiping other gods because the Lord, Yahweh, was a jealous God who tolerates no rivals, which is justified, of course, since he is the creator and redeemer and not a political ruler or an angel. He's not a man. God's jealousy is not the same as the jealousy of men, which is a sin, but rather it refers to God having the Israelites' best interests in mind always and denotes his intense desire to protect the Israelites as well as his honor. Let me give you that in marriage. There is a, there is a jealousy in marriage that is legit. There's a, when it becomes violent, it's not legit. But it's every right, for, a woman has every right if her husband, who she married, or the man with his wife, if the partner is, is, is giving attention to another man and is flirting with another man and everything, that part, marriage partner has every right to be jealous. Why? Because they, they've made a commitment to you and they, they are in love with you. They have your best interest in mind. They want to be, they've made a commitment to you and now you are going to stray from that commitment. They have every right to be jealous. If they didn't have jealousy toward you, 
or toward that, they wouldn't love you. Now, jealousy becomes sin when it becomes angry and violent and, you know, goes at, you know, you have people shooting each other and stuff like that. That's wrong. And abuse, that's not, you don't love the person if you're abusing them because you're jealous. That's ridiculous. Now you're talking out both sides of your mouth when you do that. No, there's a, a legitimate jealousy, a jealousy, a godly jealousy at times. So that's, we were, Israel was in a, in a relationship with God. We are too. And he's just saying, I don't want to share you with another. Imagine what you, if your husband said, oh, I, I, you know, I want to share you with another man. Or the woman wants to share, share you know, they want, to, they want to share you with somebody else. That'd be crazy. There are people like that. But if you love the person, you're not going to want to share them with anybody. Love demands exclusiveness. That's what God's saying. He's equating his relationship with Israel with marriage. I'm a jealous God. Just like a, a husband would be jealous if his wife is cheating on him with another man. Now, what does it mean visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the, on the fourth and third and fourth generations? A lot of people have no clue what this means. And, you know, for a long time, I never knew what, had a clue what it means until I really sat down and looked at it years ago. A lot of people misinterpret that in crazy interpretations. What it means, it simply means this. I'll tell you what it doesn't mean for us. It doesn't mean that God punishes an innocent generation for their sins. We know that because of Deuteronomy 24.16 rejects that idea. He's not saying he's going to punish the kids for the sins of their father and the mother. In fact, in Ezekiel, he explicitly says that I'm not going to judge, I'm not going to judge anybody, uh, kill, uh, punish anybody for the sins of their mother and their father, but only for their sins. So what does it mean? Well, this statement teaches God's determination to punish successive generations for committing the very same sins they learned from their parents. Meaning, in other words, if you're going to follow in the, in the example of your parents, I'm going to discipline you and judge you just like I did them. So don't follow the exa bad example of your parents if they set a bad example. God will punish generation after generation if successive generations keep practicing the sins of previous generations. Or in other words, children will be punished by God if they throw, grow up to practice the same sins of their parents who are punished for their sinful acts. Now verse 6, which we read, stands in contrast direct contrast to the promise in verse 5 to punish successive generations for practicing the sins of a predecessor uh, generation. The former presents God's desire to bless the Israelites. His desire is that the Israelites remain loyal to him by obeying him in order that he might bless them. Now to love God is to obey him, and thus to hate God is to disobey him. Verse 5 speaks of the latter, and verse 6 speaks of the former. Love and hate in these two verses are not a reference to human emotions, but rather being, one refers to being loyal to God, faithful to him, and the other disloyal. Now go back to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 3, and we'll close. Hurry, please. Zephaniah 1, 3, and I'm reading from my translation. I'm about to cause the human race as well as the animal kingdom to be destroyed. I'm about to cause the birds belonging to the earth's atmosphere, as well as aquatic life, belonging to the various bodies of water to be destroyed. Likewise, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles. So that, that statement, the wicked who produce their idolatrous obstacles, God will destroy, that speaks of God exercising his, God, his righteousness, his righteous, his righteous indignation, I should say, his wrath, and which flows from his holiness against both believers in apostasy who are unrepentant and unbelievers who are, who are unrepentant. Either way, if you're an unrepentant sinner, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, this, God says to Israel, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to exercise my wrath towards you. This was fulfilled in a near sense with, in a, in a, to the, uh, with the Babylonian invasions in the 6th century B.C., which not only affected Judah, but the whole Mesopotamian region and the Mediterranean region. A better word maybe for the near sense, if you like, it's a preview. It's a very little preview of what is going to come during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. So you can say the Babylonian invasions were a little sneak preview of God's wrath against the, the uh, idolatrous, unrepentant idolatrous world the, full, the perfect manifestation, the, the fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy 
will be found during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. You read the seven seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments, and the second advent of Christ recorded in Revelation 6, chapters 6 through 20. And you see God's exercising his wrath against an, a unrepentant sinners. And that's, well, this passage will be ultimately fulfilled during the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week, which is still yet future. So we're going to have, we have more to, uh, we'll finish off this verse as promised tomorrow. We're going to be noting uh, the last prophetic statement, the Lord uh, declaring that he will bring about the violent execution of the human race. So a lot of things we've talked about tonight in connection to idolatry will we'll be developing further tomorrow evening. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard, help us to consider what's being taught here, and if we need to confess our sins and start obeying you, uh, help us to do that, convict us to do that. And if we're obeying you, help us to persevere and to remain faithful and loyal to you in our, our relationship with you and not become spiritual adulterers. So Father, we pray for this in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen.